prior to gathering around the Lord's table and partaking from Revelation chapter four and especially chapter five. So if you can turn there in your Bible now, Revelation chapter four, and then we'll go into chapter five. You know, <clears throat> I was thinking that when we participate in the Lord's Supper, when we gather around the Lord's table, we're actually acknowledging that God's redemptive power isn't achieved by him crushing his enemies, but rather through his self-sacrifice, which is his enemies crushing him. I take you to Revelation 4, and when we get to chapter 5, we are going to get a glimpse of the lion and then the lamb. And so you found the, the chapter. Uh, in chapter 4, Revelation, it opens up the throne room for us to look into. So in Revelation 4, the door in heaven opens. John is looking in to see God's throne. And in around that throne, he sees living creatures. And in verse 8, they are continually crying out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And there are 24 elders that fall down and they cast their crowns before the Lord and they declare his worth. In chapter 4, verse 11, they say, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Chapter 5 of the book of Revelation. Here there is the one that is seated on the throne, and he has a scroll in his hand, and that scroll is sealed with seven seals. And John, realizing that this scroll is of utmost importance, it really contains the future of humanity. And the angel asks the question, who is worthy to open this scroll? You see that in verse 2. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who's worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Verse 3, and no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And as a result, John, in verse 4, wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Then one of the elders tells John to not waste his tears, because there is one worthy. Verse 5. One of the elders said to me, weep not, because the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. The lion of the tribe of Judah. I want to stop there and have you think about that. It is really a symbol of David's dynasty, King David's dynasty, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And you should picture in your mind a raging lion standing on his hind legs with his front uh, legs extended and his claws out, and he's ready to pounce, the lion of the tribe of Judah. By the way, that's the only time the lion of the tribe of Judah appears in this 22 chapter book we call Revelation. But then as we read on verse six, and I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. John turns to see the lion, and he is shocked to see a lamb. A lamb as if it had been freshly slaughtered for consumption or for sacrifice. And it says that 
he saw this lamb as it had been slain, as it had been freshly killed. The figure of a lamb in the book of Revelation, depending upon the translation, appears 27 to 30 times. In fact, in chapter 13 and verse 8, the lamb is pictured as the one that was slain from before the foundation of the world. In the former communist regime of Romania, they were determined to completely erase Christianity from their country. No Baptist pastor had any theological education, so what they did was they picked one of their young men who would be sent to the West, in this case it was the United Kingdom, Great Britain, to get training and then to come back to Romania and to share his theological education with the other pastors in the country of Romania. But who would do? There was a young man, his name was Joseph Sung, and he went. And he realized that in going, he would be paying dearly for this. But he went for Jesus. And when he was finished with his training and was ready to return to Romania, his classmates commended him for the courage that it took for him to go back to his home country and to face the intense persecution that he knew he would be facing. And they asked him this question. Joseph? What chance of success do you think you have when you return home? And he thought about it for a while, and this is his reply, and I quote. He said, I suppose about the same chance of success a lamb would have surrounded by a pack of ravenous wolves. But if the purpose of the lamb is to reveal to wolves the nature of what it means to be a lamb, then perhaps the best way is to let the wolves eat him. Jesus came as the lamb to reveal what God is like to a sinful world, and the only way that he could actually accomplish that is to let this sinful world eat him. By the way, he's not only called the lamb, he's called the shepherd. In fact, in John chapter 10, he is specifically called not just the shepherd, but the good shepherd. And the reason he's given that title as the good shepherd is because he is the shepherd that gives his life for his sheep. Now, usually a shepherd keeps sheep so that they can sell their sheep, they can shear their sheep, they can eat their sheep. But Jesus is different from all other shepherds. He doesn't keep his sheep so that he can eat them. He keeps his sheep as the shepherd so they can eat him. Jesus keeps sheep so they can eat him, so that they can wear him. When we share the Lord's Supper, we hear Jesus' words. It was read this morning. We'll hear it again. And that is, take, eat, eat. It means consume, to totally consume or devour. Take, devour, consume me. This is my body, which is given for you. So Jesus in the Lord's Supper, in that instituting the Lord's Supper in that last Passover meal with his disciples, he was inviting them to consume him. The lamb, the shepherd, he was inviting them to devour him. He said basically to them, I'm willing to give my life for you. As was again mentioned this morning, he came not to be served, but rather to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. 
He said, I am the, the true bread that comes down from heaven. You're to eat of me. You're to consume. You're to devour me. We are the sheep. And Jesus says, my sheep, they hear my voice. They're listening. And they identify me when I speak to them. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Jesus said to the disciples shortly after that Passover meal with them, when he rises from the dead and he appears in an upper room again, he says, as my father hath sent me, so send I you. And the thought that I want to have you think about in application to us is simply this. If you and I are to ever impact and change the, the little world that we live in, then it's of absolute must, necessity, that we take our hands off of our own lives and even our families' lives, that we take our hands off of our lives and our loved ones' lives so that God can spend us and them in whatever way he pleases. Does that resonate with you? That's not humanly natural nor possible. When that kind of living happens, however, it impacts people. It's the thing that changes societies and that changes culture. People don't understand how that can be, how that can happen. How can people just seemingly not care what happens to them or their dearest loved ones? There's no human explanation for it. The fact of the matter is, our gifts won't accomplish what God wants to accomplish through us. Our training won't accomplish it. Our skills won't accomplish it. Only sac self-sacrifice will be able to make a difference in our world. Only the cross is able to set me and you free from our sin and our self-centeredness that would otherwise hold us back. Only Jesus' sacrificial spirit within me can cause me to say, Father, I want your way no matter what it costs for myself and for my family. Lord, I want your way because I know that anything else is not only deceptive, but ultimately it's going to be destructive. And if I can't be totally yours, then I will not only find out <clears throat> I'll miss the point of my existence. If I can be totally yours, I'll find out what I'm, what I'm made for, and I will discover what really a fulfilled life is all about, because it's not in me. It's in me to spend myself for God's eternal purposes in the life of someone, get this, that I may not even choose to be spent for. Might be someone else that... I would not give myself otherwise for. But that's the only way that I can truly live, Lord. And that's what the cross is all about. It's most astounding when Jesus says, and you want to be like him? He says, okay, follow me. And he says, if you're going to follow me, and again, this was pointed out this morning already, you have to deny yourself. How good are you at that? How much does that happen in, in, in your life? How much has that happened over this past week? You must deny yourself. That's like, that hardly ever happens. But if you're going to be a true follower, the cross impacts you to the point where you deny yourself. And not only that, as we've just said, you would say, eat me, consume me, devour me, take up your cross. Like Jesus said, this is my body. Eat, consume me, 
devour me. As believers, when we take up our cross, we're saying, I am willing to be devoured for Christ. I'm willing to be consumed for him. And if you don't, you'll end up being consumed by this world. You'll end up being devoured by your own selfishness. For what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So that's the simple truth that I want you to think about. Because when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we marvel at the sacrifice of Jesus. But perhaps we forget the fact that that same sacrifice is to be lived out day in and day out in our own lives. That kind of self-emptying that only he can enable us to do. That we would be consumed for Christ. That we would allow ourselves to be devoured. That we might have his impact in our world, in our circle. Now that's, that's not anything to take lightly. Let that sink in. And let, let us remember that the Christian life is a serious life. And if you've chosen it, then this is what it means. This is what it's about. We don't handle, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, we're not handling the word of God dishonestly. We're not a bunch of hucksters that are just trying to pass some cheap Christianity or, or cheap message off to you so that you feel good about yourself and you feel like you've accomplished what God wants you to accomplish. No, this is the cost of being a follower of the Lord. It's serious business. And none of us are up to it on our own. It's going to require that we come to a place where we allow God to just break us. And you know what? If you resist, if you're a, a believer and you resist, he'll break you one way or another. And when he breaks you, it's actually turning out to be a blessing. Because then you willingly offer yourself. You deny yourself. You take up your cross and follow him. How many of us sitting here today or listening today, how many of us have, have been playing the game, so to speak? I mean, we, we, we're, oh, yeah, I'm a believer. I'm a follower of Jesus. But really, we're just following like Peter. You know, just as long as it doesn't cost us anything or it doesn't cost us too much, right? So as we partake of the Lord's Supper, I want you to keep that in mind. That we are to offer to God ourselves as a sweet smelling aroma. As Jesus is. <laughs>